community engagement and partnerships, a financial summary of the Garfield Heights City Schools, including uh, our five-year forecast, and effectively uh, implementing our COVID-19 protocols and some COVID updates. At the start of the 2021, 2022, excuse me, 2022 school year, uh, we began on August 25th for students first through 12th. Kindergarten began on Monday, August 30th. We have approximately 3,200 students uh, here in Garfield Heights City Schools in pre-K through 12th grade. Our strategic plan, last year we went through a comprehensive process that brought us a positive path forward. Uh, despite the onset of COVID, uh, we, we successfully completed a revised strategic planning effort. More than 100 community members, including parents, students, members of the Board of Education and staff participated. We created a revised mission and vision, vision statement, and we created a portrait of what we'd like to see in a Garfield Heights graduate. Our process included a steering committee of parents, staff, and community members that developed a mission statement and portrait of a graduate, providing ideas and direction to achieve the mission and portrait. We had six focus groups which were conducted to gather further input on the priorities and actions in each of the established pillars, which I'll go over. And the principals in the cabinet, which is the central office uh, uh, staff that reports to me, further refined the plan and consolidated the vision that the plan would achieve. The plan builds on academic rigor, holistic support of students, community engagement, enduring partnerships, and strong resource management. The plan reflects the commitment of our Board of Education to driving an based on the input of stakeholders, including students, families, and community staff and administration. It is intended to set a challenging but achievable agenda to further the mission of the district in an ever-changing world. It is flexible. The strategic plan is a work in progress. We have the opportunity to revise and further enhance the strategic plan, even within its parameters as a five-year plan. This is our new mission. As the heart of the community, the Garfield Heights City Schools fully prepares students to pursue their dreams and give back as engaged citizens and future leaders. Our new, our new vision, Garfield Heights City Schools, a premier educational institution, will be recognized throughout Ohio as fully preparing students to be leaders equipped with real world skills to contribute to a global society. We realize through this vision that we would like our students to find success through career pathways, through collegiate pathways, and through other pathways that can be established and nurtured by their teachers, their counselors, and the principals. Our beliefs, our students will have a plan that prepares them to be employed, enrolled in career training or college or to pursue an entrepreneurial career. Relationships are absolutely at the core of our success. Everyone is a leader and can make a difference in our community. Diversity of people, experience, and perspectives defines our schools. Here are the five pillars that are comprehensively addressed in our strategic plan. Teaching and learning, the core of our business, starts in the classroom, and it is where our students will be able to get success as they move forward. Diversity and inclusion, this is going to run, this runs through the entire strategic plan and all of the decision-making processes we have, including the Board of Education, uh, coming up with an equity statement and working toward a, a policy on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Wellness, the whole student being addressed through social emotional learning, access to agencies that can help students with mental health and other, other things that can help our families with emergency issues. Facilities and learning resources. We understand here at the district that we have some facilities challenges, especially at our middle school and with our athletic facility. And we are working through the parameters of this plan to address those challenges. Community and family engagement. Our community and our families are the most important aspects of who we serve here in this district. And engaging with our community through partnerships, through being able to have various stakeholders have input in what we do and enhance our, our school programming is very important to us. 
This is our portrait of a graduate. This is what we would like to see for, of, out of our students as they graduate from Garfield Heights City Schools. We want them to be socially and emotionally aware. We want them to exhibit leadership. As I stated earlier, we believe that there is a leader in every one of us. We want our students equipped with real world skills and we want them to be career prepared. Those things are central to what we would like our graduates to achieve, to be able to achieve and to be able to exhibit as they move forward. Some special initiatives we have underway. Uh, we have a stay in the game initiative. Uh, this pat, uh, the, the first home football game we had in partnership with the Cleveland Browns, a family fun night with uh, stay in the game through the Cleveland Browns. And this helps with student attendance. The mission of the stay in the game is to prioritize attendance by connecting its users to resources and tackling chronic absenteeism. We're partnering with the Browns throughout this year. and We're offering incentives for attendance, including fantastic prizes, such as tickets to Browns games to show that students how important it is to attend school. And here we have Chomps, the Browns mascot. He was also on hand for us. A couple of things we did in terms of the family fun night. We had activities, we had family togetherness, uh, we had raffle prizes, we had food and more, and everyone had a fantastic time, was able to come to the family fun night and also enter the ball game afterward. The Father's Walk was held September 23rd, 2021. It was a, it's, this is a Cuyahoga County initiative throughout the county where fathers and other male mentors are encouraged to be involved in their children's education on this state and throughout the school year. And we'd like to thank all of our fathers and all of our mentors and all of our family members that walked their children to school that day and, and remain in the lives of their students and make sure that they're help, helping with their education. Uh, we believe that the fathers are very important to that. We have successful academic opportunities here at Garfield Heights City Schools. We have AP American History. We have AP Government. We have AP Art. We have AP English. We have 19 honors courses, including anatomy, physiology, chemistry, physical science. We have the Letters Initiative, which helps us with literacy at our elementary schools. William Foster this past year won the silver medal from the state of Ohio for PBIS, and all the other schools won the bronze medal. We have a comprehensive positive behavior intervention and supports program that helps our students understand the value of coming to school prepared, being safe, respectful, and responsible, and for our younger students exhibiting what we call PAUSE. And we believe that this initiative has really uh, blossomed in our district. And, we, and again, we've been recognized over and over, and this is the first year we've had, or the, excuse me, the second year we've had a silver award. Our highly talented co-curricular and performing arts activities I can't say enough about. I'm gonna read right down this list. Music Express, Jazz Band, Student Council, National Honor Society, 18 varsity sports offered at the high school with 25% of the student body participating. We have 15 sports offered at the middle school. We have students of service. We have our drill team. We have our student ambassadors. We have our Spanish club. We have our theater department and a couple that are, aren't on here, our student newspaper, our project mosaic group that helps with diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, uh, foster uh, in, within our high school. We have our programs through our Kiwanis Club, our Builders Club, our Key Club. These are great programs that allow our students to be fully invested in their education. To kind of go forward a little bit more into PBIS, We've placed a deliberate and intentional focus on this initiative. We believe that behavior and academics do not live in silos. We believe that they are interconnected. And if students are to be successful, uh, they need to be successful in both of the, those areas. Uh, and we are so proud of William Foster uh, for their silver award. And there are several ways we go about implementing this initiative. We're, we're very uh, fortunate to be partnered with the Cleveland Browns uh, for our Stay in the Game initiative, which is tied to PBIS. We tie a lot, lots of individual awards for students uh, for exhibiting positive behavior. And we also make sure that this, run, that this initiative is from pre-K all the way to 12th grade. We have valuable community partnerships. The city of Garfield Heights, uh, including Mayor Burke, uh, has, has been a great partner with us. 
our K kids in Kiwanis uh, through uh, Judge Nicastro, who, is, who founded the Kiwanis here in Garfield Heights, has helped us. Our, our library, which is now reopening fully from COVID, uh, helps us with programming uh, for our students and, and also helps us make sure that they supplement the academic things that are happening in our buildings. Marymount Hospital has included us on their advisory council, and they always keep us abreast of the latest trends uh, that are happening. Most significantly lately uh, has had to do with COVID. Uh, unfortunately, we are still dealing with that, but Marymount has been a great partner with us. Overdrive Technologies has partnered with us to provide eBooks to our students. Uh, they are a local business. Jennings Home, we've had a partnership with them and my hope is, is that if COVID does start to wane, we can get back into Jennings and participate with programming with our senior citizens. We, we, we really miss that. Uh, we haven't been able to do it over the last year and a half. And again, and the other, the other piece is the senior group at the Civic Center that we were hopeful uh, at some point we can come back in and offer programming to them. And, and we also have our music express and our choirs and our band come and perform for our senior citizens. I do want to address COVID-19. It is still going on. And there are a number of uh, precautionary measures we have taken and are taking to ensure that our students can, were able to safely return to school. Uh, we currently do have a mask mandate in all of our school buildings. I do not have it on right now because I am speaking uh, to the public, but generally you will see me in a mask if I'm in a school building. Uh, we have that through October 29th. Our COVID-19 task force will be reviewing that in the coming weeks to see if there is a need uh, to extend that mask mandate. I have been doing it in five week increments uh, through the COVID task force. And we work as a task force uh, with uh, board members on it, with uh, uh, central office personnel, with our head of security to figure out what our best practices are. We diligently follow mass protocols and we work with students and teachers to make sure that they're following mass protocols that are recommended by the Centers for Disease Control. As of yesterday, we had approximately 53 infections, uh, which compared to other districts, we're doing quite well. And it's, it's due to the mass mandate and some of the other things we put in place. We do contract tracing of close contacts that are unmasked for the Cuyahoga County Board of Health. We are in contact with them uh, after every infection to ensure that we are doing the right thing. We have routine cleaning and disinfecting of classrooms, hallways, and common spaces, including uh, misters that we use that is able to kill COVID-19 and other viruses on contact. Reporting of positive cases is updated and it's on our website. At the top of our website, it says COVID-19 resources. You are able to click on that and get how many positive cases and at what buildings we have. Uh, we were using thermal imaging. We are using it in more of a generalized uh, way now uh, to check temperatures. Per the CDC guidance, we do not daily check temperatures, but we do use it if we ha do have uh, something, someone that is, is, is possibly symptomatic. Air ionization, which is shown to kill viruses, including COVID-19, uh, has been implemented in our air handling systems in four out of the five of our buildings. Our middle school, which has uh, more of a, an older uh, system had to be retrofitted with an air circulation system uh, that also helps circulate air and move uh, clean air through the building. And our COVID-19 task force, as I said, meets regularly, once every two weeks now. And if we need to meet more, we do. We are hopeful that these measures uh, will enable us to keep our schools safe and open uh, during this year. Uh, we believe that having in-person education is incredibly important. Uh, however, if, if there is an issue, we do have remote learning plans and they are in the works and we are working on them if we have to pivot to remote learning. And we will keep, we will keep the community well informed if we do have to do that. One of the issues that is, is causing us to look at remote learning plans are staffing issues. Um, as, as is happening with a lot of businesses and organizations throughout the United States, uh, there aren't many substitute teachers. And so if we have staff absences, we, we're taking a close look at whether or not we may need to close a building for a staffing issue. If that does have to happen, uh, I will make sure that the community is well informed as, 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 with as much advance warning as possible. Our plan with that is to close just for a day uh, and, and to pivot to remote learning. We have not had to do that yet. Uh, I will be having more information on that on my video on Friday. 
uh, and it just, just to make sure the parents in the community is aware. I, I, do, I cannot say this enough to everyone, masks are working. Please make sure that you are wearing your mask. If you're in our buildings, you're wearing it over your nose uh, and you're wearing it all day. We will have masks for you if you do not have a mask. Uh, also on our buses, by federal rule, uh, you have to wear masks on buses. Masks are the one equalizer we have against this virus. If, if I could say anything, that's one thing that will help us keep the schools operating and open. Personally, I would encourage anyone that's eligible to get a vaccine to please consider it. Uh, at this point, uh, teachers are now eligible for booster vaccines if they have received the Pfizer uh, vaccine. Uh, most of our staff did receive the Pfizer vaccine, and I sent out information for them to receive booster shots. Uh, the other uh, two uh, vaccines uh, have not been um, cleared for booster shots. That's not to say that they aren't effective as well. Uh, the two ways out of this, of this issue, as I see it, are through masking and through vaccination. However, I, I will say that we understand that this is a choice people need to make for themselves. But the masking, that's not a choice in our buildings. We need that to keep everybody safe. So please mask up. In conclusion, the state of our schools is great. <laughs> Generally, I think that our strategic plan is going to guide our work for the next five years. Our staff and our teachers have done a remarkable job going through the COVID-19 unfortunate experience and also coming out on the end where we now have in-person learning taking place and activities taking place. We appreciate everyone's patience and flexibility as we go through and continue to go through kind of a trying time. But we are here to serve your students safely and effectively. And we believe we, we're gonna be able to do that throughout this year. I would like to thank the Garfield Heights community, our partners, our parents, our families, and everyone for making this a successful start of the school year. And we appreciate all of you. With that, I'm gonna turn this over to Mr. Saluka, who's going to brief everyone on the district finances. Well, I'm not sure it's gonna be brief, but. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Henke. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to update the public um, and those watching, those in attendance, I wanna thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for the central office who's supporting here. Thank you to Mr. Fruits and Ms. Bailey who set this all up and allows us the opportunity to uh, broadcast this out and not have everybody here. I know with the COVID uh, issues going on, um, I do appreciate those that are in attendance and those that are watching and those that will be watching. Just so everybody knows, we will get this uh, PowerPoint presentation up on our website uh, probably sometime tomorrow. Uh, so to go back and uh, if you watch this, you can go back and peruse these at your leisure. Since we are a learning institution, I am gonna go through and kind of do a little bit of uh, education on the district finances, not just a where we're at today, but just um, all about the district's uh, finances and, and how we account for um, all of the money and, and some of the funds that we take in. It's gonna be pretty comprehensive. Um, as I was going through the slides and, and working with Mr. Henke and, and following through and I go, whoa, there's a lot of slides, but there's a lot of information. School finance is not just a in and out thing. There's a lot that goes into our, our financial uh, picture, a lot that goes into our, our finances here at the district, a lot of moving parts. And uh, you'll see that. So we're gonna go through the key financial areas. We're gonna talk to, on the components that we use for sound fiscal management. And that ensures the future financial health of the district. And it also allows the Board of Education to make sound financial decisions as we move forward through the, uh, th th move forward through the years. But what did I wanna talk about here? And I wanted to start out with going through the district. Uh, everybody thinks all we have is just one big operating fund and we don't. We have a, um, all this is, this is called fund groups, general special revenue, debt service, capital project, enterprise funds. We have internal service funds and we have agency funds. Overall, we have 31 separate funds that go into one of these categories. They're pretty self-explanatory. We have a lot of federal grants. They go into the uh, special revenue funds. The capital projects fund is the uh, permanent improvement and the uh, building fund. 
We have a bond retirement fund for the bonds, separate accounting for that, enterprise funds, which is our food service fund. All these classifications are dictated by the uh, uh, AICPA, the uh, American Institute of Certified Public Accountants and for public accounting purposes. So we don't just have one big operating fund. We have 31 separate funds that we need to um, account for the different pots of money that we have here. The only difference I say is the general fund is not restrictive. The rest of these funds are restricted. So we can't co-mingle between a special revenue and a capital projects and agency funds. They all have to be accountable in their specific funds. So if we run short one where one place, we can't use the other ones. So that's just wanted to get that part out. But we're going to concentrate on the general fund because it is the general operating fund of the district. And that's the basis of our overall operations and the basis where most of our money comes and uh, how we operate the school. So we're going to concentrate today on the general fund. First thing we're going to talk about is revenues and the revenue sources. We have, um, I broke this down because we have really kind of three main revenue sources, but I'm going to say it's mostly two state revenues and local revenues. Those are the two main shares. And you can see from the percentages up there, our state revenue share is 59, makes up 59% of our overall general operating revenues. The local sources of revenues make up 40%. And then the other financing sources is uh, um, usually just advances in. So the biggest bulk of our money comes from the state and local. And I'm going to go through these and what each one is, because this is a, these are the two biggest areas that uh, make up our operating funds. From the local share, we have our, as you probably can imagine, real estate taxes makes up the bulk of our local share. Um, most school districts, all school districts, not most, all school districts are um, re heavily reliant on real estate taxes. Um, so we are no different from, from that standpoint. The only difference is, is that we're not as reliant on the local share as we are in the state revenues that we get, but we'll go dive into that a little bit more. But the bulk of our uh, local share is the real estate taxes. And I wanna talk a little bit about our real estate taxes because um, if we're, how, how are the real estate taxes calculated and how much is the breakdown that comes to the school versus going to other entities? And I, and I have a little bit of a slide on that because I. I think there's a little bit of, not confusion, but I think there's not many people really know the nuts and bolts of how their property tax bill is, is calculated and where all that money goes. The big thing is I think everyone thinks the real estate taxes goes all to the schools, income tax goes all to the city, sales tax goes all to the county, and it's not really that cut and dry. So we're gonna concentrate now on the real estate tax. The real estate tax that we get here is based on three things. First of all, it's the tax levy, the millage amount that you levy against your property, the effective millage, which is the tax levy goes against the effective millage amount, and then the property valuations, what your property or the property in the whole is valued at. So you have the effective millage, the tax levy, and what you're taxed at, and the property valuations. They all come together in generating our real estate property taxes. So when we talk about um, these things, I gave a breakdown here and you could see, um, here's the breakdown and I'm gonna show you real quick. Here's the breakdown of all of our levies that come to the school. You, you'll see here, there's a, we call it, they call it the inside millage unvoted. Then you have the current expense continuing. So you have, we have three emergency levies we have two bond issues and we have a permanent improvement. All of these levies here is what generates the bulk of our uh, real estate property taxes. The big thing here, and I'm gonna to show this too, is that you know the current expense we have, it's called voted, and then we have effective. Uh, there is a rule, and I'm not gonna go into this because it's real convoluted, House Bill 920 that doesn't allow school districts put back in the 70s. It did not allow school districts to uh, receive inflationary revenues. It's what was voted in. And that's the revenue piece. And you can only collect what was voted in. So that was the current expense. So if you see here, current expense, you see what was voted in is 29.9. 
mills, we're actually only collecting 23.89 of that 28 that was voted in due to House Bill 920. The emergency levies here, the difference between that and the current expense levy is because the emergency levies were voted in as a dollar amount. So you can only collect, the millage is only assessed whatever generates that dollar amount. So as our valuation goes up, the less millage is assessed, but it's only what that dollar amount is. The bond issue, we're only collecting what came due on the bonds annually. These bond issues were voted in in 2002 and 2003 for the building of the high school and the addition for William Foster. We're still collecting on those and those mature 2024, 2026. And uh, what we've done over the years to help the district, and it's kind of like minor, uh, it kind of falls under the radar, but we've refinanced thing, these uh, debt issues over the years to make less millage being assessed to the, to the community. And then the permanent improvement is a continuing levy. You can see here again, it was, uh, voted in at 1.5 mills, but we're only collecting 1.21. So that's the, when we say effective millage, that's it. So the school district really is getting 73.21, but for the operating, you're only gonna see the upper ones through the emergency here is what we're collecting. Now let's uh, contrast that with your tax bill. Also, here's the other entities that are collecting property taxes. These are all voted taxes too. These are all voted taxes from the community. You can see Cuyahoga County, uh, the Cuyahoga Valley Career Center, Garfield Lake City, the Metro Parks, Cuyahoga County Library, Cuyahoga County uh, Community College, the Cleveland Cuyahoga Port Authority. You will always see these. So these also contribute, whoops, wrong button. These also contribute to your, uh, the millage that you're paying on your property taxes. So it's not all coming the Garfield Heights City Schools. And that's why you'll see a lot of levies like the library levy on, or you see the, uh, the, the, the Port Authority on. So I, I point that out and I, I did a little uh, figuring out here. And what ends up happening is really, so 57% of these levies of what's generating your real estate tax comes to the schools, 57%, not the, the whole dollar amount. So I just wanted to show that's, that's where your money is going as a homeowner here in Garfield Heights. Those are that you'll see these on your tax bill when you get the next one, which I think is coming up here in December. So I just wanted to show you that there's a lot of uh, moving parts and in, in levies in play on your tax bill. So when we go here, um, we talk about property valuation. That's the next thing. Property valuation is broken down into residential, commercial, and then the public utility personal property, which we call PUP. Garfield Heights, we say this, Garfield Heights is a residential community. 71% of the valuation that we assess the millage against is residents. It's always been a, a home community ever since I grew up here back in the 60s and 70s. So a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of burden falls on the, the residents here in the community. Um, over the years, we saw a lot of uh, commercial um, stuff coming up and down in the commercial, but there's just not enough land to balance that out with commercial because it, it has been a residential property. So, um, so we're highly reliant on the residents here. So what's this, some of the things that come into play when we're trying to determine what our real estate taxes are going to be? What's our real estate tax revenue going to be? And there's a lot of things that come into play in between the years. Um, Every three years, there's a reappraisal. Every nine years, there's a triennial update that changed the values, property tax appeals. Um, if you're, you know, after a reappraisal, you can go down to the county, uh, board of revision, board of tax appeal, exempt status changes, new constructions. All these things come into play when you're trying to determine what we're getting in real estate taxes. So we have to be cognizant of these, these things in play here. And I'll go to show you this in the next slide is because here's the real, uh, the valuations over the years. And you can see here in our slide, and it's kind of like 2015 was a three-year reappraisal. 
In the resident side, the value dropped 13 percent. And for commercial, it dropped 14, almost 15 percent. Go to 2016. Even from the reappraisal, you can see our valuation continue to drop in those three years non reappraisal. Okay, so now we have 2018, the triennial update. We can see a uh, increase of 9.4 percent and 11 percent. The valuations are starting to come back. And now we come to 2021. I'm not sure if everybody's been reading. It's been a reappraisal year. And all the information on it, I know the plain dealer had some articles on there. I have a thing from the county auditor right now based on what they're seeing and home values. It's really based on home values is that we're seeing a Garfield Heights could be higher. And the plain dealer had a higher, but what I saw, what the information was, that it was going to be an 18% increase in your values in Garfield Heights, your home values, the commercial values is going to be an 18% increase. So what does that mean? Yes, you're going to probably pay more taxes. That's, you know, your home value goes up, you're going to be paying more taxes. But the benefit to this is your home value is coming back. So your house is worth more. And when a house is worth more in the community, it brings everything up. It, it, and that's, I, I want to say that even though it's going to raise your taxes a little bit, Having a, a higher house value brings everything up. People want to come here. It just, it's, it's a boon. So 18%, you're going to see some like, uh, well, question marks. I couldn't think of it for a minute. It's my bad. Question marks here is because I don't know what the final numbers are going to be for the residential and commercial valuations. We won't get these until the state certifies it and the numbers will come in probably sometime uh, November. November, December, until I know what those final numbers are. And as far as the PUP values, it's totally different from reappraisal. PUP is on the public utilities. We don't get those numbers until late December. So that's why I don't have numbers for 2021. Keep in mind, when they say 2021 or any of these valuations, it's always the tax year 2021 collected in 2022. So what your, your value is, they collect it the year after. So. But I need to caution when they say that your value, your house going up and you're paying more taxes because of House Bill 920, the school district doesn't reap a whole lot of revenue from this increase. And that's, uh, I think, the, so it's, it's, a, it's a benefit for everybody else, for, but from the school district, it's not a windfall. So we still need to be cautious about that and, and watch and make sure. Now we're getting to the state source of revenue and the biggest thing in the state source of revenue, as I said, is we're heavily relying on the state. So we were really watching the state biennial budget because we get most of our money is the foundation basic aid. And this was a, I want to say a, a very hot topic when it comes to school finance especially in the spring when the legislators are going back and forth between the governor, between the house and between the Senate of just what those final numbers are going to be in the state budget, because it directly affects the school district's funding. So we were highly uh, in tune to what's going on. So the biggest thing is, is that we need to look very closely on what the final budget is. The benefit to schools, and we were so happy to see this, is that the, the state um, finally came to an agreement between the House and the Senate on doing the um, fair school funding plan, which treasurers, superintendents, board members, we were pushing the state legislatures to get that passed. This is a long-term funding plan that adequately funds schools. So we were highly motivated to hopefully that the legislators would come around and agree to that. And, and they did. But once again, it's never easy. And well, you know, I'll say here in a minute. Um, we are a formula district. That means our funding from the state is based on a formula for our, our foundation basic aid. There's a new formula under the school funding, um, fair school funding plan. Um, the issue is, is that, it, which was 
really good to see, except the state. That was a six-year plan to fully fund schools. So to bring us up to where we need to be, that was a six-year plan, except the state legislator said, well, we can't burden future legislators with this plan, so we will only fund it for two years. So it's a six year plan, but we're only funding it for two years and we're funding it at 35% of the full funding amount that you should be getting. So where do we go from here? So well, it's, it's better than what we, we were receiving. So, but we need to be cautious as we go, go through that. The fair school funding plan, I put this, this thing up here, be, uh, slide up here thing, slide up here is because I wanted to say it addresses a lot of the issues that weren't addressed in the old funding formula. Uh, professional development for teachers, health, safety, social, emotional needs of students, academic, athletic, co-curricular activities, and technology. It took every school district and looked at those things and, and said, what do you need? On top of the capacity. What is our capacity to generate revenues here versus the more affluent districts? So it takes into account our capacity with property wealth and income wealth, not just property wealth, but income wealth. So it took those into account too. On top of, they also are funding, they looked at gifted education, special education, English, learn, um, English uh, language learners, say that quickly, economically disadvantaged and transportation. All that now comes into play and they have a funding mechanism for each one. That was the fair school funding plan. That's why we were pushing for that because everybody was on the same playing field and you fell out where you were. I like this little slide here. I put this in here because this was the estimates that we received back when this was all going through the legislature and trying to determine um, what the fair school funding plan would cost. So what they did is to Legislatures, before they pass any budget bill, they got to know what they're passing and how much it's going to cost. So they put this estimate out there. So this was our simulation that we had a chance to go through. And I know it's tough to read and, you know, the, the slide and everything else. But here's the thing. This is the key thing. For everything, if we were receiving the full funding of this new Fair School Funding Act formula, we would be receiving... $33.2 million, which would have been a jump from, from our previous last year's calculated funding amount. That would been a, a, an increase of $13.7 million. Okay, what are we actually getting? $2.3 million this year and an additional $2.2 million next year. So we're not even receiving our full funded amount based on the state's new calculations. And on top of that, who knows what it's gonna be because it's only a two year budget. So, I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, we'll take this, we, we, we do it, but as treasurers and when we plan out the future and you'll see this later on in my five year forecast, we take this all into effect. But when you're heavily relying on the state, these are the numbers that you're, you're relying on and this is what you need to, to keep going. So. So what I did is I took those numbers, I have my forecast, so I put that in there and all right, wrong button again so i put there this is where we're at you could see that we went down from last year and i'll tell you why in a minute as we go through and then i forecasted 24 25 and 26 i'm going to give the legislatures the benefit of the, fit of the doubt and say that the next group of legislature will continue this fair school funding plan and fund it as a six-year plan that's my um, forecast now. That's what I'm looking at. I'm optimistic, trying to be realistic. That's my assumption right now. But they could say, as whoops again, they could say as we get through 24, 25, 26, that up. Oh, well, wait a minute, no, we can't afford it. So we'll just flatline it across. I don't know. I mean, that's just something that when we get to this two-year period again, that we need to reach out again to our state legislators, whoever's representing us in that two year period and keep pushing for this fair school funding plan. But you can see here, we went from 24 down to 21. And the reason being is when they put together the new formula, they also under the state legislatures took out, we had deductions going to the community schools, Ed Choice schools, Peterson scholarship, 
and open enrollment. They had those deductions directly coming from the from us. So what the state legislature did under their new biennial budget, they said, well, no, you don't have to pay this through your school anymore. We're going to pay it directly from the state. Okay, that's great. I mean, that cuts our expenditures by $4 million. But, okay, the $4 million had to come from somewhere. It came from the overall funding of the schools. So when they recalculated what we were getting under the new, they recalculated less $4 million out of last year's funding. So what they did is you go back, let's go back. We started at 19 instead of the 24 and moved up. So it's kind of like, you know, okay, we lose it here. We gain it here. Oh, no, we lost it here. We, we lost it here. So they're trying to say that's an apples to apples comparison. Okay. So, so as I get through this, and I, and I don't know, because the state said, okay, we, we have your calculations. We're still working on the final numbers. They don't know what our final calculated amounts are. They're still working that at the state level. So if I, I wanna show you what our actual funding amounts, I don't wanna show you the simulations because they're not accurate. They were just a, a budget item that they needed. I don't know what our final numbers are. They won't come out until October, November. I'm hoping that they're out in October, so at least we'll have some basis. I have the calculations that I can work through. I have a simulation and I have a program that lets me work through those numbers. I'm working through that now with our forecast five, but the final numbers are not gonna be coming out until late October, early November. And then the last piece of this uh, funding from the biennial budget is the governor had a wellness funding for the school district that was separate out. We were getting wellness funding. This wellness funding was now rolled into, it's not separate anymore, it's now rolled into our calculation for our, our, our funding, which is okay. I mean, it's, you know, we were spending it anyways, and there's gonna be a restrictive piece to this to ensure that we're still spending on wellness and um, what that restrictive piece is, they still haven't determined uh, what that's gonna be. And so we're still waiting on that. So we're still waiting for on, on some things from the state. And so as part of our challenge for uh, moving forward with that, that's okay. So we have this all part of our calculation when we go through to the uh, financial forecast. Now to the other side of the, the ledger, as we call it, the operating expenditures. Um, we follow uniform school accounting system. So we follow the fun, we call fun function object. It's a step down, step down, step down. And I'll go over what each one is real quick. It's like, as the, before the train rolls through, you probably don't know if you could hear that in the background. That's our train in the background. That's actually somebody coming down the hall, the doors are open. So, but yeah, well, actually it's the wake up call for anybody that was watching the first part of this, but okay. So we have it by function, which is instruction, pupil staff support and extracurricular, administration, fiscal business, facilities, maintenance, um, and uh, transfers advances out. And you can see I, I put up there the dollar amount and the uh, percentages and almost 70% goes to instruction, which additional 8%, which really puts it at like 76% goes directly to supporting students. And when I talk about extracurricular, I'm talking about not just academic extracurricular, but the sports and all those. That goes directly to support students. And then the, the administrative piece and administrative. Um, so you know, we also have the object area and it's uh, broken down by object. And this is what you see in the forecast is personnel services, personal services, employee retirement, benefit purchase service, supplies, materials, capital outlay, debt service, lease purchase, other objects, other financing sources. This is what we usually, this is what I always refer to when I talk about, this is more key than, than the other ones because I think this kind of gives an idea of just where we are at. We're a service organization. We're dependent on delivering services to our students. So we are people-based. So the majority of our costs go to people. So when we look at this, um, we want to make sure, I mean, that's, that's why you see such high amounts. So a little bit of a, a uh, history or not history, a little bit of an educational piece is what goes into the personal services. Well, we have certified staff of teachers of 281 teachers, classified staff of support, um, uh, 
149. We have administrative staff of 28. We have qualified staff of 16. The qualified staff of our, our, our intervention managers and social workers of 16. We have an exempt central office staff of 16. We have supplemental. So we're not, we're paying coaches through here um, and personal services. And we pay any severance, anything else that's uh, related to salaries, wages, benefits comes out of the personal services. Then we have the, uh, the employee retirement and benefits. Retirement, Medicare, um, under Ohio law, we are required to pay 14% of all of our employees' retirement. Medicare, under federal law, 1.45% we're required to pay of every employee's salary. Health insurance. Health insurance is negotiated through the unions. Our district belongs to the Suburban Health Consortium. There are 20 districts in the Suburban Health Consortium. What I like to say of belonging to the Health Consortium is that, does it save us money? Yes and no, but what it does do, it stabilizes health costs increase. So over the last three or four years, and, and I'll just talk about even this year, the last three or four years, I think we've only averaged increases of roughly, I think the highest one was 6%. We've had two years of 0%. And this year going into um, the next period here of our um, premiums, a 2% increase, which is in the health industry with everything going on is pretty darn good. It lets us stabilize our healthcare costs. And on top of that, in the negotiated agreements, our employees do pay a share of their health care premium. The district doesn't pay the full boat. We've negotiated where our employees also contribute to their health care here in the district. Then workers' compensation based on salaries. And then, unfortunately, unemployment kind of over this COVID thing reared up again a little bit. So we, we're, we're paying a little bit more in unemployment. So that comes out of there. Purchase services, what comes out of purchase services, property technical services, uh, pro property professional technical services, which is our legal services and any other technical services that we do, property services, some of the insurances, or do we have like a maintenance contract, travel meeting expenses, communications, which is our phone, utilities, which is natural gas, electricity, water, come out of the purchase services, trade services that we use, any outside uh, um, companies comes out of here, special education out of district tuition. So we, we spend a lot of money for students that get placed out of district. Um, we can't get around this. I mean, so this is just something, it's a necessity. If, if we can't service a student, we find them where the best place is for them. And we let that, that the experts uh, educate them. And then we pay this out of here open enrollment out of district. We have a bunch of students that open enroll somewhere else. Some districts have free open enrollment. We have a closed enrollment here. We do not allow it, but if somebody wants to go to another district, we need to pay um, for open enrollment. The biggest one right now is Cleveland. I'm not sure why any of our students want to go to Cleveland over us, but I won't go there. And then pupil transportation. Um, there are some special needs students or sometimes that we can't transport. We're very, you know, this year has been really a crunch for transportation. So we need to hire a company to transport some of our students. So that comes out of here. Then you can see here, we eliminated the community schools ed choice scholarship deductions. I talked about that a little bit earlier that uh, from the biennial budget, we're, uh, you know, not uh, accounting for that anymore. Supplies and materials, um, real quick, instructional supplies comes out of here, instructional software. Instructional software is big, big ticket item. It allows us to do remote learning. We have a whole bunch of curricular software that we use and a whole bunch of software programs that allow our students to learn outside the classroom. It was critical last year as we were learning from home to be able to, to offer all, a whole bunch of the, uh, these programs and uh, to uh, teaching and learning, uh, Ms. Reisland, to our technology coordinator, Ms. Sherry Bailey, getting these programs in place so our students didn't have any drop off in learning from home. Uh, support software, um, we use other software programs to support some of the programs or some of the uh, items in our district, uh, textbooks, library materials, Health supplies is a big one right now. 
that we need. Um, office supplies, maintenance supplies, we need to maintain our building and the vehicle supplies. We maintain our vehicles, mostly our buses, comes out of supplies, materials. And then the last one, I'm not capital outlay, we, we're mostly um, big ticket items. It's, it's mostly been computers and uh, servers out of there. But here's the other one that we're, we're, we're charged for. I can never understand this, but uh, the county collects our property taxes and then charges us an exorbitant fee to do that. Okay, you know, I can never understand how they calculated that, but that's for another day. That's kind of like my uh, uh, pontification. Election fees, there's no such thing as free elections. Let's just say that. You know, another one, bank fees, audit fees, professional organization, membership, insurances, and building assessments come, comes out of the other expenditures. So now we're getting down to really what it's all about for us here in the district. This is, a, this is what we, the tool, the main tool we use to financial plan. This is a tool that we're going to use as part of our strategic plan. This is a tool that the board uses that I, I bring to the board that allows us to look for, okay, are there gonna be any shortfalls? Where do we target um, any areas here that we have that we go through and just say, hey, uh-oh, you know, there's a little bit of an issue. We need to start looking at what we can do and I'll go through this and show you what I mean here in a minute. So we're required, the school district is required to submit a forecast twice a year. The original forecast in November for the next year and then a, a May update. Uh, it's based on, and I say this all the time, and it's based on critical assumptions. I mean, we just, you know, I, I base all my numbers on assumptions of events I think are going to take place, like these basic foundation aid. What's that going to look like? Not in two years. I know what that budget is, but what's going to look like three years down the road? Where's our real estate valuations going to be three years down the road? And how do I calculate what I think the real estate taxes are? based on what are the collection rates, the valuations, all those things come into play that I put down exactly what I'm thinking, you know, and, and try to get as accurate and as, as, as I can. So based on, and then uh, what I like to say, and this is, I'm, I'm a firm believer in, in the five-year forecast. We do also do a three-year forecast for the board because once again, three years is, is I think more realistic. Um, I really don't in five years, when you go out five years, a lot of things come into play, but the, the state legislature said five years for their forecast. We're going out um, three years, five years. We are the only political subdivision that is required to do a forecast. Even the state only does a two year budget, but we're required to do a five year forecast. Would I be doing a forecast if it wasn't required? Darn right, because it's good, sound financial practice. So here we have um, my forecasted hour, I'm not mine, it's our forecasted revenues. And I have the actuals here and I have what I have forecasting going forward. Unfortunately, revenues not, do not grow as fast as our expenditures. And you can see here, we're kind of like growing a little bit and that's because of the state. I have projected state basic aid increasing. A lot of times our property taxes, unless we get an influx, unless the mayor, thank you mayor for coming, unless the mayor can find us some more new construction in, uh, in the commercial side where we get a big taxpayer coming in, our real estate taxes you know, run pretty much true to form. And so we go from there, but you can see here, we had a, a, a big increase in 19 and then we dropped down to 2020. And the reason we have an, a big increase here is because through the abated property, there was a catch up of, we have a shared income tax through abated property with the city and we were trying to catch up. So we caught up here. That's why there's a big dollar amount here and it's a little bit of an anomaly. So if you're looking at it, that, go, well, why did it go down from there to here? That's because we had a big catch up with the city for shared income tax that we did not get in the next year. Some of the things, and we talk about, in a, and I put this in my forecast, and we, it, the revenue summaries, because I like to um, articulate just what everybody's looking at and what we're looking at here. And we always look back. We always look back in, in history and then where we're gonna be going forward. And am I conservative in my forecast? Yes, I am. I, I freely admit it. I, I tell anybody I'm very conservative 
conservative because I don't want to be the person that goes to the board in the mid year and said we ran out of money. Or at the end of the year, yeah, we're falling a lot shorter. So I am very conservative. But I say that and I say how I get where we're at and I say where we're going to be going and we, we follow through with that. So, you know, total revenue increased over annually over the past five years, 2.2%. Uh, but uh, going forward, based on everything that I see today and putting in, I have all these formulas and I do, I forecast each revenue area as we go through real estate taxes, uh, the pup taxes, the tuition, all the, all the revenue, the found, uh, not the, the foundation basic aid, the restricted state grants, the Homestead and Road Crack, I forecast all those areas of revenue, the same with expenditures. I forecast all those areas of expenditures and put it together to come up with a final forecast. That's how I do it. So when we talk about the, you know, matching up and then the real estate property taxes, um, you know, the biggest variance, and that's because, you know, I don't know from one year to the next, the valuations are going up. Then somebody comes back and says about dropping the valuation down because they filed an appeal. So we try to play that out. One year we had a big collection of delinquency taxes. The next year it was a COVID year. We didn't have such a big collection. So it dropped that way. What are we going to collect this year in delinquency taxes? I have a forecasted amount. Hoping the taxpayers follow through and pay it, but you never know. You know, people were uh, last year, they were hurting, understood that. And then once again, I always say this, with 56% of the district's funding coming from the state of Ohio, we're highly reliant on the state legislature and anything they're gonna do to affect that state funding, whether it's the foundation basic aid, whether it's taking away um, the, any homestead and rollback. I know a couple of years, or I wanna say 10 years ago, 15 years ago, the state eliminated the personal property tax on businesses, directly affected schools. They eliminated the homestead exemption and rollback exemption for commercial. Okay. The commercial had to pay that, but, you know, in the, in the directly affected businesses. So any legislation that comes down the road that could affect school funding. So, and we're high, high reliant. That's why we look very closely at the, the biennial budget. Here's my uh, expenditures forecasted and, and compare. I just wanted to give a little idea. And you can see here how, I mean, Salaries are going up. We know that uh, cost of living is going up. Inflation is going up. We build that into the forecast. So forecast expenditures, um, we show it as increasing too. In, in expenditures, and I'm not going to read this, um, but I did want to put this caveat in there because right now I've built in a forecast of wellness dollars and ESSER money. And I'm going to talk about ESSER in a little bit. What I like to do in, ex in the expenditure side, operating expenditures, if there's another funding source that I could shift operating expenditures to save money on the, on the bottom line so we can push out, I will do that. So what would end up happening when the wellness dollars came in, I shifted the well, some of the um, wellness money that we would have used for the general fund, I shifted to the wellness dollars, mostly the intervention managers. So I shift that to wellness. Well, that's, that's coming back. Same with ESSER, whatever ESSER allows us to do, if I could shift some of the operating money to uh, save the bottom line, I shift it over to ESSER. So, but wellness, so that was my little, you know, so I state that in the forecast. So people know why is this, or why did this drop down? Why did the salaries drop down? So I put that in the forecast to show and state it right there of what's going on with wellness and the ESSER money. Here is the bottom line, the basic forecast. Um, I call it the simplified forecast is because my forecast is if you go on our website, you'll see there's a very comprehensive document. The board gets a very comprehensive document. This is simplified and just, you know, basic. You know, we start with the beginning balance. We have our revenue, we have our expenditures. Um, we have uh, the ending balance. But this is the telling sign for anybody out there in the community is, as I tell tell the board about the forecast. When you start spending more than you're taking in, that's one thing. That's called deficit spending. When you start deficit spending, what it does is it eats away your balance. And then when you start getting to these 
bigger dollar amounts here in 2024, 25, and all of a sudden you're going, you're eating away, your balance is a negative. What that tells the board here in 2022 is, and I'm going to throw a little caveat here in a minute, that you need, the district and us need to start planning for what we're going to do to mitigate all this, the state 98, 900,000 spending, this 1.6, 1.9. What are we going to do? What this forecast allows us to do, we start planning now. So in 2024, we don't hit this cliff. That's what we do. Now, I put this up there as of June 30th, because this was the forecast at the end of the fiscal year. A lot of things have changed since then. So this is what the board got mostly in May. The next forecast is coming out in November, and there's a whole lot more that's involved right now, as I talked about the final basic aid amounts, uh, the ESSER money, where that's going, or, you know, how we're going to shift. So the, the new forecast is, is not going to look like this. But I just wanted to show you what we concentrate when we do a forecast. This is another thing here. Deficit spending here. Right when it starts 215, five, uh, you know, we can mitigate these, but the 900,000, 1.6, this is the telling sign in the forecast when all things being equal. So then I put an executive summary here. And when I talk about different things and the cash balances and projected the worst by 2025, I'd like to put an executive summary there that summarizes the whole forecast and it kind of gives an idea where we're going. That's the forecast in a nutshell, but there's more that comes into play now with, with the schools. And I it would be remiss if I didn't talk about the ESSER funding that the school district is gonna receive. We received ESSER one, we're receiving ESSER two right now, and we're gonna be receiving ESSER three. You, that's all we read about is how much money is being thrown at school districts, at public entities. ESSER one allocation for the district is 1.29 million. Um, we've already used that with our ionization, uh, computer purchases for remote learning, um, health supplies. We've used up the ESSER one money. ESSER two, 7.15 million that we've now planned out for. So we have a plan for ESSER 2, and what we've targeted ESSER 2 for was our strategic plan and hitting those things in the strategic plan that we're identifying that where we can um, use ESSER money for. It allows us to start implementation, our, implementing our strategic plan. You heard Mr. Hankey go over different areas of a strategic plan. So this allows us to stabilize and use that money for the strategic plan. And then ESSER 3, 16 million um, is coming. We need to spend that. Well, I missed that. ESSER 2, it has to be spent by 2023. ESSER 3 needs to be spent. That's wrong. It should be 2024. So we still have some time to plan. We have ideas. We're, we're mulling around. But right now, we're still concentrating. We have to concentrate on ESSER 2 before we get an ESSER 3. But there's a caveat to that. There is, and I'm not going to read each of these. But there is a, all these things, your ESSER money has to spend under one of these categories. So we just can't go out and use it for whatever. So we have to target one of these categories and it has to be COVID related, COVID driven. But the biggest caveat that we have here is, oh, and I like to put O oh, down here, other activities necessary to maintain the operations, the continuity of the services in the LEA, and the continuing to employ existing staff of the LEA, which is the uh, lo local education agency. I don't know what that means. We have asked ODE to find it more. Does it mean we've thrown scenario as, as out? Does it mean this? Does it mean that? They don't know what that means or what we can use it for under that category. I know what we're using it for. We're using it to maintain staff. But the, the problem is, is nobody can tell us until they tell us you can't use what you're using for under that category. So that's the dilemma a lot of school districts are in of using this money. The other thing is, is that the inspection, testing, maintenance, repair, and to improve the indoor air quality of school facilities, including mechanical and non-mechanical heating. So. Can we use money for the middle school? Yeah, we can, but 
but only in certain areas can we do. We can't, you know, we can use it maybe, we can use it to probably put, you know, air conditioning in. Can we use it for windows? Can we use it for uh, certain roofing? Yeah. Can we use it to fix the electrical grid? No. Can we use it for other purposes to maintain? No, it has to be recover related and indoor air quality. So we're, you know, we have a plan in place, but we're, you know, we're trying to get creative, still live within the guidelines of the ESSER money, but we really, it's like, you know, can we give it to employees and raises? Mm, it doesn't fall under one of these categories here. I don't know. Can we, can't, you know, what does that mean? Is that, uh, so we're still working through that and, uh, that's kind of our dilemma, but that's some of the things that we need to deal with when we talk about ESSER funding and, and we do, and you know, the team works together to, to figure out where we can best use this money and, and still fall within the, under these. And we did a presentation to the board of education on strategic plan and use of ESSER monies in some of the strategic plan areas. And I think that that's, uh, it was, it was a good, uh, good plan. So with that, um, Everything that we do as a district in the financial side, any financial information can be uh, gone out and, and gotten from any one of these uh, websites. We try to be, and we pride ourselves on being as transparent as possible. So any financial information we have is up on our website under, under the, uh, the treasurer's uh, area. Same with these others. I mean, all of the information that I get, I use these resources, the real estate taxes and all that information valuation comes from the fiscal officer, Department of Education. Um, we get all of our basic foundation uh, uh, funding formulas and some of the and uh, some of the documentation from the Department of Ed, Department of Taxation certifies the overall property valuations. And then the Garfield Light City Schools, that's our website as a plethora of information. It's out there. If you want it, it's there. We, we try to be, and the board has always maintained, they want transparency and the fiscal side of it with our financial records. So it's there. And with that, um, that concludes uh, my presentation and uh, anybody in the audience, I know that uh, Mr. Hankey said, you know, send us questions. Anything on here, I mean, you're going back and reviewing the, the PowerPoint presentation. If you have questions, I mean, I went through this pretty quickly. There's a lot of information there. It's a school fund financing is, is, there's a lot of moving parts. It's not easy. It really isn't easy. And it's just very complicated. And it's not a fun subject to talk about. And I'm sure everybody's at home going, maybe I'll watch this at 10 o'clock and uh, I can fall asleep because I have uh, insomnia and I can just put this on and I'm out. But if you are going through and you're interested, uh, email one of us. We have the answer. And if we don't have the answers, the administrative team has the answers because they, they're, they're a lot smarter than I am. So with that, um, I just, you know, real quick, you know, let you turn over sort of closing comments. Mr. Hankey, uh, thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. If you're watching at home or watching it later, thank you so much for your interest in the schools and uh, in school finance. Uh, thanks, Mr. Saluka, and thanks to everybody that uh, has been watching. We haven't received any, at least on my email, any uh, okay. questions. Uh, I know we have a few folks here. If anybody has any questions, we're happy to answer them at this time. Um, we really appreciate the, you know, a very comprehensive overview of school finance. It can get complicated. Mr. Saluka makes it easy for us to understand, and we appreciate that. Um, is there any questions from the audience about the district? Well, with that, I think we'd like to conclude uh, tonight's presentation. Again, uh, if you are watching at home, thank you. And if you watch this on our YouTube channel, please don't hesitate to contact us. Uh, I will give the board office number, 216-475-8100. Yes, for Mr. Saluka or Mr. Hankey, we will get back to you very quickly. Yep. Um, we're happy to answer all the questions uh, about the district. Thank you.